And welcome to this panel on music and artificial intelligence as part of the Abu Dhabi Festival 2023 Riwaq Al Fikr Talks program, organized by ADMAF and in collaboration with the MBZ UAI. Many breakthroughs in the field of AI have been punctuating recent years. In music, new algorithms and machine learning models are greatly optimizing various processes, while questions around authorship, creativity, and the impact on jobs uh, are now also widely debated. As AI grows in popularity, more industries are considering how they can leverage this technology. Though the relationship, as you've mentioned, uh, between music and AI has roots in 20th century computer music, and arguably as well in the relationship between mathematics and music, um, how are new, the new technologies affecting music in the performing arts? How can they bring about unique forms of artistic expression? This is the subject of our panel today. I'm Mariam El Askeri, and with a background in philosophy, art history, and public programming in music and performance, uh, I'm currently studying ethics in AI and data and algorithms. It is my honor to welcome our panelists today. Joining us on screen is Dr. Gus, as you've heard. Dr. Gus Shia is a global network assistant professor in computer science at New York University, Shanghai. He's currently joining us from New York, and he's a visiting professor here at MBC UAI. Um, and just to add a little bit to, to his bio, uh, he's interested in the design of interactive intelligent systems to extend human musical creation and expression. And he is, in fact, a professional Chinese flute player. Um, welcome, Dr. Gus. Uh, Hassan Hajeri, on the far left, is a composer, artist, and independent researcher who divides his time between his native Bahrain and Seoul, South Korea. His sound art performances and installations build on his academic interest in historiography and ethnomusicology. Hassan is currently music department manager at Sharjah Art Foundation, and he has in the past acted as curator at Ar Riwaq Art Space in Bahrain. He is also an accomplished oud player and is an advocate for Arabic language music journalism. Warm welcome, Hassan. And to my left is Mohammed Al Ugaili, the vice president of product at Anghami, the leading music streaming platform in the MENA region. He is passionate about using data and creativity to build user-centric products and experiences that drive growth and deliver user satisfaction. With a background in computer science, Mohammed's experience lies in startups, growth, software engineering, and product management. It's really great to have you, Mohammed. So just to begin on some of the technical aspects of the relationship between AI and music, um, I would like to ask Dr. Gus, uh, what are the current applications of AI in music? Thank you for the question. There are many. Uh, if we consider uh, the music activities of human beings, human, we read music, uh, we appreciate music, we perform music, and we compose music. And through all these areas, we have music AI tools to facilitate and uh, help people better to compose, perform, appreciate, and even learn music. And um, uh, maybe I can just name a few. Um, the currently uh, widely used, uh, you know, for composition, we have composition softwares, and for electronic music nowadays, we have DAW, which is uh, compared to a hundred years ago, the the way we compose music is revolutionized. You know, a hundred years ago, the composer have to lean on traditional music notations, and the music notation is kind of a high level abstraction of the music ideas. They cannot be flying down to the ground the timbre, the feeling, the tempo, um, you know, the concrete sound. But nowadays, the composer, um, the composer's job is kind of composer plus music uh, producer, and they can mix every single sample they want. So that's, you know, on the, uh, just one example on the uh, composition. And Muhammad is, is more expert on music appreciation side, and I, I maybe I will just uh, um, say a few more words on music education. You know, uh, in a hundred years ago, and in a traditional way, we learn music by, you know, leaning on the notation. And actually, even before that, there's no notation. We just human beings, um, you know, person to person communication. 
And later on, we figure out that that is not efficient enough and not so effective. So that's kind of one driving force people you know, invent this language of using notation. It's just like, you know, you know, in a very ancient time, we have a, a spoken language, but not written language. And then the written language, which is music notation, happened. And, and lean on the, the current technology, um, the, the guidance can be not only, you know, uh, visual, which is music notation, but, you know, acoustic, which is in the traditional way to learn music, but can be also haptic and multimodal. Now we have, have ways to, to build robots that can directly, you know, guide your performance, guide your muscles, and building the muscle memory to learn music. So, so it really, technology is open, is opening new doors, new pathways for, our, for us to compose, perform, um, learn music. Uh, that's, that's, you know, just great to see all this happening. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gus. As a leading researcher in, in this field, um, what are the current challenges of building AI models for music and the performing arts? <laughs> um, <laughs> there are many, many challenges. Um, on, on the theory side, um, on the theoretic side or on the, on, on the scientific side, is, is to really build a good model of uh, music AI, we have to understand music down to the ground. And, and the theory of, of music activities, uh, music perception is actually, on the one hand, creative intelligence, which is a big topic. On the other hand, aesthetic perception. So creative intelligence is more uh, manifests in the process of, of composition and aesthetic perception is more manifested in the process of appreciating music. So that's on the theoretical level. And that's kind of part of the reason why, uh, you know, previously we, we call it computer music. Now we call it music AI, because the theory, the scientific merit of, uh, of music is, is deeply connected with the, the core of artificial intelligence and or intelligence science. What is inter human intelligence? So that's on the uh, theoretical side. On the, Practical side is how we can build um, AI tools or software that could really be useful for the current musicians. And the musicians, they have their own musical need and the current music uh, AI tools still have a gap. We talk about math, we talk about you know, samples, we talk about different ideas, but the mindset still has a very large gap layers of ab abstraction gap from what the top tier musicians are thinking of. That's why that we see there are a lot of experimental music going on, very good, but you know, the top tier musicians, um, they, they're still very cautious about you know, using AI tools. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to you know, be the bridge uh, <clears throat> between the technological side and musical side. Uh, that's you know, uh, on, on the, at the practical or the engineering level. And also there's a social level when the science and engineer could uh, come together, there's a social level, which is in the future, how could humanity and AI co-evolve? And I think music is, is a good pathway because you know, if we're thinking of um, autonomous, autonomous driving cars, um, I can imagine that um, in, in 100 years or 200 years, there could be a smart city that uh, there could be only smart agents or machines and they, they should care about you know, autonomous driving cars, vehicles from point A to point B. And the, the algorithm is how to you know, arrive, point a, for, arrive point B from point A using you know, less energy, be more efficient, uh, you know, less costly. But to be honest, I cannot imagine a future city that two robots just playing music together because Music is not only an object, it's, it's a medium. It's a medium of human emotion and expression, right? And we feel something and we express. That's kind of the fundamental uh, feature of, of humanity. So music is a perfect subject for us to figure out a way that how in the future AI and human could co-evolve rather than one step just to, you know, a hundred yards uh, away and, and one to sustain it. Yeah. Um, so, hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Yes. 
Um, on the note of uh, the sort of social or, or cultural um, relationship maybe between AI and music, um, I was wondering what your thoughts are actually to, to all of you as well. If it's um, important for the narrative of this interaction between AI and music to be a part of, uh, let's say, a creative artwork or um, sort of that, yeah, that this, this dialogue be known to the listener or the audience, or if it's kind of a seamless uh, part of, of the process at this point. Um. Right. Um, so, you know, again, this, this comes down to your idea of what music composition or art production means. Um, I remember a few years ago when I was early in my kind of interest in music composition, I liked composers who used kind of uh, indeterminate, indeterminate techniques, things that are, they'd use randomness, they'd use chance to, to generate sound. And the result is, uh, as you can imagine, sometimes it could be a mess, you know, but sometimes it's really interesting. But I, I also met other composers who said, no, it's nice to somehow reveal the process of that randomness within the sound itself. So th th especially through like minimalist composers such as Steve Reich, they particularly like this technique that you can hear the development of of a sound as a piece of music progresses um, through this minimalist kind of pattern. So he, that was his critique of kind of the indeterminate composers such as John Cage and things like that. But with all that being said, um, I think there's a few things that are important to remember. I think music, um, contrary to a lot of the cliche kind of, um, um, you know, um, expressions about music, th this idea of a music universal language, I don't think it's true because music is is oftentimes very cultural specific. So music from um, Mongolia, for instance, um, has its own history, its own tradition, its own culture and meaning. And for us, from s somebody from Abu Dhabi, for example, who um, has a different understanding of music and upbringing and things like that. So that's what makes music so fascinating and, and also makes um, the space for artificial intelligence um, more complex um, because many times um, there's a sort of bias in, the, in what, what it means to create music. So on the piano, you only have the black and white keys, for instance, traditionally. But And even the black and white keys, the tuning system historically is problematic. And um, so, uh, for, exa for example, my case as a oud player or somebody who is interested in Arabic music, I find it, you know, the, the theory that I'm particularly interested in, or I also studied Korean traditional music, and that's a whole other set of... Um, you know, cultural kind of, um, you know, connections. And so, yeah, I mean, all with all that being said, um, just to add to what Professor Gus has said, th is that there's, there's so many variables. Uh, and I think the listener, many times, they wouldn't know um, what is created by artificial intelligence and what isn't. And I don't think it's important, you know. I mean, maybe the musician can say, by the way, we did this. But maybe most listeners aren't interested. They just care about the final result, you know. But... Let me add just a f small stuff here. So I don't think it's a black or white. It's not, I don't think it will ever be the situation where it's either 100% generated by humans or 100% generated by AI. It will always be a mix. You will always be using different tools to create any, any art. And AI is there just to help make it easier, help provide you with tools that help you generate the content and create the content without having to go through very manual work mm -hmm. that musicians or artists go through today. It's just like how Google replaced the mm, yellow books where you used to go look for the address or the phone number of someone. Now you don't do that anymore. And that's exactly what AI does today. It replaces all the uh, effort you need to do and removes it and lets you be an artist. Let's, let's an artist be an artist. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess in addition to kind of uh, automating certain parts of the process or facilitating parts of the process, what kind of um, surprise or novelty or new understandings of music have you um, experienced uh, using AI tools or maybe uh, through other musicians? For me? <laughs> Please, Mahama. So, so now we must have many. Many insights through the, through the you know you have a huge amount of re 
users and through using the app and the music appreciation, you must have many yeah, you know, definitely. valuable experiences to share. So in our case at Anrami, um, there are a lot of insights that, that are sometimes surprising. For me, the, the core thing is more local. So generally on Anrami and on other, pla other platforms, the number of songs in total or unique tracks is currently above 70 million unique tracks. The Arabic ones between these are around 600,000. That's less than 1% of all the content in the world, which means for anyone studying the music in general and the users in general, every single Arabic artist is the same. They're Arabic. Because they, they all sit in that small bubble. If we look at the map of music, they're just that tiny dot that is Arabic that includes Wigs, Fayrouz, Amr Diab, uh, uh, any new artist, any old artist, Abdul Halim, all of them are the, are the same. They're part of that very small uh, dot in the map, which is for us problematic. For us, it's like we are not 1%. We're much more. So when you look at that content and you start studying that content and you start building models for that content, you end up somewhere else. What we did at Anrami is more on the recommendation part, on actually being able to generate models that predict what kind of music that people like who like this music would also like. The upcoming challenges for us and for other people in the spectrum is actually understanding, uh, as Dr. Sa the Dr. Goss said, there's, there are a lot of being done to understand the actual music and the composition of songs. Today, there are many models that allow you to know if there's a guitar or a piano in a song and, and try to actually filter them out. There is no model that tells you if there is a oud in that song or if there is um, any Arabic instrument uh, in that because nobody went into that. There's a, there's a lot to be done when it comes to Arabic music and, and in, e in each of the different sectors of AI and music, if you want. Um, and those are things we go into every, every day that we uh, end up trying to discover and ch new challenges every day when it comes to that. So, so in your in your way of kind of building uh, algorithms for for the user experience, listening experience, you're you're kind of um, you're you're not sort of basing your algorithms on other platforms or other uh, uh, methods, yeah, based yeah. on this data. Yeah. So there are multiple ways you would recommend content. Mm -hmm. uh, one is uh, called collaborative filtering, and one is content based. Uh, so collaborative filtering is when you rely on the usage of content to predict the future usage. Mm -hmm. So we would actually see, okay, what are users who listen to a Fairuz song listening to after it or actually like uh, the same way? And you end up finding the other artists that those people listen to. So when we get another user who wants a Fairuz song and wants recommendations based on it or likes a Fairuz, we know for a fact that they like someone else, and we actually give them that artist. That's collaborative filtering. When it comes to user, uh, to sorry, content-based, it's actually understanding the actual audio, what key it's using, what BPM, um, what energy. Uh, is it a sad song? Is it a happy song? What instruments are they are there? What voice is playing? Is it a male? Is it a female? And then trying to match it with other songs that have similar. Um, uh, similar qualities. What we use is actually a combination of both. Our model actually uses both the um, uh, collaborative data and a bit of the actual audio data to, pr to give you, to, to build that similarity between songs and actually build that map of, of music and users together. Thank you. Um, uh, Hassan and Dr. Gus as well, I would, I would, I would love to know what sort of um, what sort of surprises you've had through the creative process, the collaborative creative process with AI? Well, I mean, uh, yeah. excuse me, I'll just jump in first. I'll, I'll get, hand it over to you after I'm done. But um, for me, I mean, just just wanted to explain that the process of making music, it could either be composition, it could be performing live, it could be recording a piece of music, um, and so there's different ideas of what it means to make music, you know. So com composition is just a process of maybe creating notation, for example, and then giving it to musicians to perform it. But there's also a process of being able to take audio samples and sounds on your computer and using that to create music or 
you know, using an, a an AI tool, for example, live on stage um, on your computer usually um, to to create something. Um, but you know, in my case, I, I you know I feel like AI has made my work a, a bit easier as sort of a low budget um, musician because I work oftentimes alone. Um, so in my bedroom, for instance, I just have my desk, my computer, um, very simple equipment around me. And with that, I can record a full piece of music. Um, it could last for several hours. It can even be a piece of music that can run for, I've done music that runs for 50 years um, on the computer. And uh, <laughs> um, so you can create systems like that that just generate more and more. Um, and, uh, and then what you do is you can also bounce or export the audio and using, again, AI systems to mix and master the levels. So to make sure that the quality of the sound sounds good on a CD or an MP3 or on a streaming platform, um, that you just make sure that the, all the sounds are balanced. So, And that also gives it that professional kind of final touch. So I don't need to go to a very expensive recording studio and, and pay someone thousands of dollars to do that when I'm on a very, very small budget. So it makes the economies of... Um, of AI also um, change the way we think about sort of the, the financial side of what it means to make music or or to consume or to listen to, to consume music to suggest music to to make music and yeah in, in a way in a way but uh, it has its problems as well you know <laughs> yeah you are a one man army <laughs> That's a surprising power of AI. <laughs> you know, um, I like to share my experience. So on my side, there are many surprising stuff. And um, actually, every day I encounter something surprising to me. Uh, I like to just share uh, some examples from two aspects. First, from a scientific or AI perspective, is uh, through these years, um, you know, in the beginning, uh, we, when we build this artificial intelligence, you know, you know uh, this computation of models, we think they are so different from human models. But as time went by, uh, when things become deep learning and uh, you know large scale models and uh, and um, even you know, in the time of uh, Bayesian networks, um, I, I gradually realized that the learning principles uh, behind human learning and machine learning are sometimes not that different. And in practice, I do see that the same algorithm or the same um, way, the same training technique could be applied to both human learning and machine learning. And one example I like to, um, to raise here is that I mean, if you take a machine learning course, you know what I mean by, by um, a teacher forcing and schedule sampling. And which is, you know, in the beginning when we teach, uh, when we train the machine learning model, it has no knowledge. And so we have to give it the ground truth. And then as time goes by, we do not have to feed the ground truth to it. And we can let it sample its own, uh, uh, generate its, its own stuff. And I actually apply this technique to human learning. And because we have a haptic device uh, on learning a flute, and, uh, and when human learn the flute, uh, there are correct and wrong movement. So in the beginning, we figure out that we have to do mandatory mode, which is uh, analogous to, uh, you know, teacher forcing. But we cannot always do teacher forcing. If we always do teacher forcing, the learner lose, you know, the active perspective of the learner. And we have to de decay it and, and tune the parameter in a careful way so that in, at the end, the learner just learn how to play the flute on his own. And actually in educational science, there is a corresponding word called scaffolding and fading out. So, so here is the perfect correspondence between human learning and, and machine learning. On one side, we have teacher forcing and, uh, and schedule something. On the other side, we have scaffolding and fading out. And just to, this is just amazing to me that, oh, I can use the same way to teach machine if I find a way uh, that is so effective on human learning. And, and um, and vice versa. So, and that's a huge benefit for me uh, as both a musician and a computer scientist because it, it tells me that I can I can fully rely on my musical uh, musical um, you know intuition to train my artificial intelligence models, and also I can you know lean on my you know uh, deep uh, introspection as a human being how I feel 
you know, how I perceive the world to, to train the model. Yeah, so that's kind of the surprising thing on, on the scientific side. And on the musical and practice, practical side is, it's always surprising to me that how fast and how seamless the musicians could grasp the idea of the, of the technology and just to quickly turn the tools into, um, into a creative process and they quickly use the tool and adaptively use the tool and use that in a so creative way. And let's, um, and that's kind of uh, related to, to your previous question that is this a similar, you know, um, organic um, process. I think it's, it's becoming very quick. Um, and uh, that's also why I'm so cautious about this, this process. Let's, let's have an example beyond the scope of music when we say, oh, I'm, I want to search some knowledge. I want to learn something from a data set or from a library. Um, what, is, what is the you know, activity do people do? In the old days, people go to library and people are so used to you know, uh, searching for cars and, and uh, how, how books are, uh, are arranged on the shelves. In the old days, people are very used to it. And, and then Google, is there. And when we say search something, we even use the word just Google for it. And we are so um, just uh, trained to, to the new scheme of searching that you type some keywords and it give you a whole bunch of you know, candidate answers. And we are so used to click on them and check them one by one. And now the new paradigm maybe is coming, which is chat DPT. You can just ask something and just tell you something. And uh, the problem is what it tells you may not be true and that's a huge problem. But that is the new paradigm of, you know, of, you know uh, searching because it's more, kind of more natural. For example, I, I, I wanna, um, I don't know something and I want to ask uh, Professor Eric, uh, what does that mean? And he may tell me something. And that's kind of a very natural way that between human communication. But what he will also tell me is, okay, that's my understanding, and you should read um, the old papers in 1970s, 1950s. That's what you should read. And that part, ChatGPT is, ChatGPT is not there yet. So same thing is there for, for music. You know, in the old times, we even metronome. That's kind of uh, around the, the Beethoven time. And people just start to use it so naturally. We say, oh, the BPM, the beat per minute, uh, is you know 120 or uh, 140. In the old days, we use uh, Italian words to describe the tempo, and people just don't disagree on that. And later on, we have FM synthesis, which is created by Professor Zhang Changling at Stanford University. And the the essence of FM synthesis is you can use two oscillators to create very rich timbre, and that give, gives one to DX7, which is the a first generation of electronic music. And, but the problem of, uh, of FM synthesis is you can, well, yes, you can use two oscillators to create all kinds of timers, but the reverse process at that time cannot be figured out, which means if I know what sound I wanna figure out, I have the sound in my mind it is impossible for me to do reverse engineering and figure out the tuning parameters of FM synthesis. And then the Yamaha's engineering come into place. And, and, and Yamaha engineer and a whole bunch of, you know, the new generation of musician, they just tune the, the parameters way better than the AI researchers because they are musicians, they have sharp ears. And just within two to three years, and, and you see the musicians can use timers way better than engineers. And this is just a miracle. So, so um, that's the, the surprising side um, on a, on a music, uh, from a music pr practice perspective. And uh, I do think we should be cautious because we, we see the successful cases as FF synthesis, and we also we also see kind of successful but debatable uh, cases. Um, um, let's say MP3, right? I mean, we we think MP3 is a compressed audio form, and the people's auditory system won't perceive it. That's why we we, we invent it, and it's more efficient. It's good.
but also because of MP3, the whole generation of music listeners, they may lose the sense of hi-fi music. And that's kind of, uh, this is debatable um, technology. And, and now we have you know, music recommenders and new tools for, for um, composition and performance and education. That's why, you know, um, because anything we invent will so quickly be turned into music practice. So technology defines music and music, you know, uh, also defines technology. It is a very active loop and um, we're, we're on our own. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gus. Um, I would like to uh, return to, to an earlier point that you mentioned about how um, training the machine, machine learning and human learning are actually quite similar. And um, not to go too far into a debate on semantics, but do you think that the um, training the machine is now also part of the creative process, that, that sort of the computer scientists who are choosing the, the data sets and um, writing the code are also, in a sense, very now heavily involved in the creative process? And I just want to add to that um, something you did mention earlier, that now music production is very much considered a, an artistic role. It has creative, um, it's a, it has the credit of creative authorship, whereas uh, previously it was composing, performing, or songwriting that was sort of attributed to the artist. Uh, so I'm just wondering what, what your thoughts are on, on the changing of roles now, and creative roles. I guess that's, I, I want, want to first listen to Hassan's advice on that because he's a composer and producer. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an amateur uh, composer, so I mean, <laughs> I'd like to first hear his voice. Well, um, you know, I, I do think, you know, there's, there's different ways of, um, actually there are examples, even in pop music, of people using um, sort of supervised and unsupervised um, um, training methods. So for one example, something we were talking about before, Holly Herndon, she had a couple of albums, well, her last album, um, what she did was she and her team they had this computer that was listening to all their private conversations and all a, any kind of audio that passes through their computer, for example, your Skype conversations or Zoom conversations, whatever YouTube videos you, you listen to or watch, uh, whatever music you play on your computer, your computer spying, she created a system where the computer spies on you, records all the possible voices, and this computer slowly over time, they called it spawn, like it's like a baby, it, it, pick, it learns to speak and make voices based on all the sounds that pass through the computer, and uh, they did it for over a year. And the result is they created a and they created a, a musical choir with live people. But one of the members of the choir was this computer, the Spawn, and uh, and they created a pop album out of it. You know, so it is being used in pop music. Not it's not just in like high end classical music, like super academic. Even in in pop music, it's it's part of the landscape now. And um, and I think it's it's. It's fun. Uh, it's it's interesting, but you know, um, yeah. I mean, that's an exa That's a. I mean, this is a very extreme example, but yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that I. I mean, I was very excited about when when it came out, and I I, I also went to see concerts related to this. I saw them perform it, and it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, that to me was one of those fun examples. Yeah. Um, Mohammed. Oh, sorry, were you going to um, chime in? No, I just wanted to say that I, I started as a software engineer, and I did not work on ML models much, but there's always lots of creativity being done by software engineers, whether in machine learning, AI, or everywhere else, because this fine-tuning of parameters that the doctor was talked about is extremely important for the end result, and uh, there's always this discussion of what is possible for us to do. And what is possible always depends on the creativity of software engineers to see, to know what they could try or couldn't try or what, what could work or not work. And they keep experimenting, experimenting till we get into something. And there's a lot left to be done uh, and no answers, no, no right path towards where we should be going. And that's also left to, to engineers all over the place to actually figure out the path for. Is uh, so then is the the path or the sort of the end goal of of a software engineer when working with 
let's say music or machine learning models with music is it to to um, to succeed what is actually the measure of success uh, in this case and is flaw or imperfection important when talking about something like in the context of a creative process yeah i mean in the case of ChatGPT, for example, we go back to music, but when it, w it comes to actual text content um, generation, one of the current flaws of text generated by GPTs is that it's too perfect. So in reality today, th any tool that detects AI-generated text, what it's doing, it's trying to see how perfect the text is. If the, the essay was written in a way where every word is chosen very correctly. It is the best word to be used in the sentence, and the sentence looks really neat, then it's too perfect for a human to write it. Then it's definitely written by AI. Um, so now, actually, one of the challenges is to make it less perfect and f more, uh, that's why they tell you, if you, if you want to trick your professor, just put some typos here and there, and it's no longer made by AI. Um, <laughs> um, but in music, I think the beauty of art is that there is no right answer. So uh, there is no perfect song. There is no perfect piece of art. So whatever is gener AI generated or computer generated is a piece for us to play around with. And there's one misconception here is that AI allows anyone to become creative now. Anyone can become an artist by just writing a text and then you have a, a drawing or a painting in front of you. But if you look at all the content, as they say, now. yeah. But all the content generated online, you can notice that even that requires creativity. I failed to create a nice painting, even with that prompt, because I don't have that mindset. I don't know. I don't. I'm not an artist. But you can see actual artists using using those tools and coming up with amazing stuff. So it's it's again it's a tool, but the creativity always is with the human. The human is the one that is making that that impact. That's a very good point. Thank you. And and I, I do have the same feeling that um, the uh, the when I, when we build the AI tools for music, uh, we have to keep a balance um, between naturalness, which is human life, or creative. And um, it's a hard task. And uh, for the long term goal of you know the creativity inside a software, I guess the goal is is the creativity of the software should be sealed in a way that humans do not notice the creativity inside it. And that's a long-term goal. And uh, for example, uh, we say, uh, I, I write an article. And you don't say that I rely on so much creativity that, uh, that uh, is, is intrinsically there in word or pages, right? Because the, all the fantastic work is already sealed uh, inside the product, it, it becomes a, a tool, a well-engineered tool for you to use. And, and this interface between engineering and uh, human creativity uh, evolves over time. And in, especially, I guess, you know, in the domain of art and, and music. And the uh, uh, graduate, you know, um, as time goes by, the engineers and AI researchers and musicians will figure out a nice interface that above that is human creativity that we can easily notice. And below that is actually, I will say machine creativity, but well sealed that human do not notice that, that much. That's interesting. So in a sense, the, um, the seamlessness is what will spur more expression and more creativity and collaboration between the machine and, and the human? I've got a question. I mean sort of a question and a comment at the same time. Now it's open to, my question is, you know, um, since we're in a university and, and Professor Gus was talking about this idea of learning, you know, or teaching um, or training, you know, um, teaching something, um, you know, and now this idea of, you know, AI as a, as a way of, as a paradigm for, for teaching um, and how there are some analogies or some similarities between teaching a computer to do something and teaching um, or an algorithm to do something and and teaching a person to do something. I wonder if this um, 
you know, this is what this is one side of th kind of how does that change the future of education overall? Like, what is it? That does that have an impact on what we think of higher education in the future? I mean, this is just a question I have. But um, and the second question I have is, um, you know, um, technically, you know, we, we it's nice to celebrate AI as a, as a tool that's accessible, it's open, but there's a there's a certain level of privilege also in being able to access um, tools like uh, AI, to even just to sit down a computer, dig around on the internet and find some interesting algorithms and, and try to apply them in within a musical system. This requires uh, some kind of like a privileged education, privileged training in kind of knowing how to use this stuff, even if it's free and even if it's available. But, you know, I, I just think it's important to acknowledge that we still live in a time where things like AI requires some kind of privilege as well. So that that those are the two things that I I also think it's it's kind of it's important to be wary of AI. It's not a it's not an immediate solution that solves everything right now. It's still I think very early stages and uh, and I think in the future for people to learn like what you were saying earlier about you know when you're trying to create prompts or trying to create an idea like if you want to generate an image using an AI software you can tell it okay paint me a, 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 a landscape with a red sky and dogs raining for, you know falling out of the sky you know I mean you can imagine that and it would generate it for you but to be able to have that kind of imagination where you create these prompts and these these kinds of parameters um, that requires a different type of thinking altogether and uh, maybe that's the type of maybe that's one of the ways in which education would need to go you know think more um, in that sense but Inter interdisciplinary or intersectional yeah. yeah I have one one very interesting story related to that um, five years ago I was I was uh, volunteering in Lebanon uh, with an NGO and I was working with this 17 year old uh, student he was illiterate in a sense and we were teaching him how to write then he told me some insight that was like mind-blowing he told me I don't know how to write but I do know how to type. He knows how to text me on WhatsApp, but he cannot write on a paper because it's a whole different skill to actually draw a letter on a piece of paper than just know how it's drawn and selected. And that takes a whole new level of education because do we need to teach children how to draw letters? Is it that important today like it was important 20 years ago? Because most children, I, I personally don't, I, I have a very bad handwriting. It's getting worse and worse because I never have to draw a letter anymore. So so back, in, back to your point, um, I, I think the core of that painting is not drawing the dogs falling out of the sky. It's thinking of them. And that's the core of, of art and creativity. So might as well not worry about how to draw that dog but worry more about how to think of a, uh, uh, how to grow your imagination to think, to end up thinking of such a drawing. Because those are the pieces of art we like today. We're not like, oh wow, he knew how to draw the, the dog. That was 100 years ago where we were fascinated by the way they're painting. Today we're fascinated by how they thought of this idea. And now it's much easier for anyone to do. Mohammed, on I, that. I, I do have a lot of reflections on these two questions. And first of all, Mohammed, is on um, the AI created art domain, one so important uh, a pair of concept is the so called content versus style. Content versus style. And, and the content and style um, concept is, is hierarchical. And uh, that, that's what makes it complicated. And speaking of the handwriting uh, uh, thing, is the symbolized stuff is the content. A and it depends on our purpose. If my purpose is to just send you a text message or where you tell me what to do, or I want to ask you the password uh, or how to log into some website, then handwriting is not needed because we only need the content. However, if you are teaching me Arabic calligraphy and uh, I have some self reflection and say, oh, I have. Here, the style is quite uh, similar to the Chinese calligraphy uh, I, I've been practicing for years. Then style comes. You know, style is the things that we can name it somehow, but we cannot define using symbols. And in arts, we have layers of abstractions. And think of music, right? 
down there, we have, we have just sound. And through sound, we have a style called timbre that we can use words to describe, say bright, dark, but we cannot symbolize it, right? And then there's something we can symbolize, which is pitch. Okay, so now pitch is the content and, uh, and, and we can put a, uh, consider content and style uh, at that level. And we say, oh, chord, chord is the content above that. Is, chord can be symbolized, C major, you know, C minor, uh, seven chord. But when polyphony is there, the combination, the rich combination of, of the symbols, which is we call the texture, the poly polyphonic texture of music, that part cannot be symbolized and, and that left as a style. And we can do more layers of abstractions on top of that, music forms and, and et cetera. So, so it depends on what we are going to do. And I think AI tools will give us uh, a nice interface for content and style. For content, we just use it. For style, we just throw us into the style and to be immersed in that and, and experience it, right? And that's, that's kind of my, my uh, reflection of, according to my research. And, and that's also so related to Hassan's, um, uh, the, the question or, or the, the comment on music education. Because, you know, speaking of music education, why it's so hard is partially the reason that, that sometimes in the old times, we only teach style, but not abstract content. And uh, ever since industry revolution, we, we focus too much on music theory, which is the content side, but forget the style. And now it's a good time for, you know, for us to use AI to pick up both content style and combine them together. And if we think of music education, you know, when, when I was a student, a music student, when I learned music, and uh, some teacher will say, oh, you are a genius and you, you are smart, and I feel so good. But now I become a professor and become a teacher that word become a knife here in my in my heart because if we re rely so much on music genius, it means our music education system doesn't work. I hope that makes sense. I mean, if you are a genius, whatever education system I'll throw on you, you, you can grow, you can learn something. But our goal is to let normal person and uh, lay persons um, in large majority experience music and, and, and all become musicians. I, I guess there's a possibility. And for that sake, uh, we need a new education system that uh, you know combine content and style. And uh, I think we have a bright future in front of us. Yeah, for, the, for the education system to kind of pick up on the breadth of forms or styles in which various people do different things, whether they're of the same kind of category of thing, music or writing a text yeah um, and, and we are of course still uh, very far um, we're, we're just get started in this long-term goal and as Hassan said that you know um, uh, AI too shouldn't be a privileged thing it, it should be a way to democratize music education and when I think of what is the best music tool existing in the world I always think about the the audacity actually uh, any of you have download audacity I used I, I feel very proud because that, that was invented by my advisor at um, uh, Carnegie Mellon, Roger Denver, it was invented by his team. But well, I also contribute a tiny bit in that. And uh, he told me, well, in the website, it described, it, it got downloaded millions of times per month. And, and when I was a PhD student, I just, just knocked off his door and said, hey, uh, uh, Roger, you, you had a typo. You said you had millions of downloads per month. That can't be true you mean you have millions of downloads so far, right? And he said, no, Gus, I, now we get millions of downloads per week. And I was, wow, <laughs> we need something like that in the future, yeah. Yeah, there are a, a few tools that I've uh, come across recently, like never, never before heard sound. That's a, a common now online accessible tool for anyone who would like to uh, make music using uh, AI. 
it can sort of uh, streamline a few uh, difficult parts of the process, like transposing a score or uh, splitting a track into stems if you want to kind of take out a, uh, a bass or a vocal from a track. So yeah, we, we have a few tools coming up. <laughs> um, I think it's time maybe to open up the floor to Q&A. Yes. All righty, thank you. No, uh, thank you very much for very simulating. Uh, you know, I come here with an open mind, and I hope to learn something. Uh, the the AI they say will be replacing all of our accountants and all of our lawyers and all of our you know the mundane jobs and the mundane things. Uh, do you see a time where AI will potentially replace uh, musical composition? And in this, uh, from from within this. Uh, is there a library of music uh, like the, the genome uh, project in which all the music comes into one depo uh, depository and it's assessed and it's included and then it can be generated to say that maybe Hassan wants to create a piece of music and the combination of notes has been created like 10,000 times before him, you know, so better you change something and is there something that we will be moving into in the future that can assist a musician in his creative process? And finally, uh, uh, would we be to the point, I, I, I mean, we see it now with the visual art, as you mentioned, the, the, the red sky with the raining dogs. Uh, let's say I want to have the, the, the Mozart uh, piece uh, that's done, that was taken by Feyruz, and I want to have it with a, uh, with a taqa from, uh, from, from Bangladesh. How would, you know, you, you instruct the, the AI to produce that. We are coming to some point in, in, in which this will exist. My, my, my question is uh, related to this. Are we, are we going to make ourselves redundant in this process? And I think that we won't, but I, I you know, give me reassurance that we won't be redundant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I can I can try to answer some questions. You know, the this idea of redundancy of of jobs being lost and things like that. There's actually a lot of interesting conversations going on. One of my favorite speakers about this topic is actually a musician called Brian Eno, and Brian Eno is considered to be like the father of what's known as ambient music. Or, and he he has recently over the last ten years he's been doing a series of talks about he's arguing for basic universal income. And he's saying that uh, our understanding of economics, for instance, like capitalism, you know, is based on an, uh, f several hundred years ago, and it's based on this idea of scarcity. But we live in a time where things aren't as scarce as they used to be. So we live in a time of abundance. Therefore, people, human beings, should be, given, uh, should be allowed to relax and enjoy life more. So AI should be there to make our life easier. It's good to get to have AI do all the accountant work and all that stuff, so we can, you know, sit at home and <laughs> focus on our hobbies like music, you know. And um, I mean, that's one of his kind of suggestions. And it's I don't know how realistic it is, but it's it's a nice thing to imagine, you know. But um, I mean, with that being said, I think I, I you know, for example, some jobs it's very possible that AI will replace. Uh, it's very possible, but I also think other jobs or other kind of tasks it's almost impossible because it depends on how the knowledge is is created, you know, like, uh, for example, in the case of poetry, like the idea of poetry, the word poetry, poesis, it's it's basically the, the act of taking something and giving it a new meaning, all right? So, and the, the, a person's imagine ability to imagine giving something uh, a second meaning or a third meaning, that's where the art is, that's where poetry or poesis comes in, that's how the human mind um, works as well. And so I think that kind of imagination, maybe we can train the computer to do that in the future too, you know, but, uh, but, uh, but for now I kind of, I, I just, I don't think it's a very, um, I don't think it's a doomsday kind of, it's not a very, it shouldn't be a depressing kind of scenario of people losing their jobs, but I also don't think it's a very optimistic situation either, you know, somewhere I'm kind of ambivalent at this point of like where things are, you know, it'll be good and bad at the same time, but I don't know how everybody else thinks. Just want to add to that uh, one is, I think we've had many different times where people were like, 
our jobs are going to be redundant. It starts even with the Industrial Revolution when everyone was like, the machine is going to take our jobs, and then the internet, and then now AI. But imagine how many people would be working at Yellow Pages companies if, the, if Google does not exist. Or uh, imagine how many, how many um, phone books you'd have at home uh, having the phone numbers of everyone you know. There are many jobs that became redundant without us feeling it. Imagine how many librarians we'd need if there is no Google. How many libraries people would be at to write their papers and study and do all that. Um, so some jobs did become redundant and some more jobs are going to become redundant with time. Electronic cars might re replace truck drivers. Um, AI might replace uh, accountants. Um, but that just means exactly that we have time to focus on more things. and. It creates way more jobs. The internet or the industrial revolution just opened the doors for millions and millions of different things that can be done by humans, not just on the creative spectrum or, or, or going focusing on our hobbies, but actually doing stuff that matter more and have m bigger impact. And I think it, we're very far away from having any automation replacing creative work. Uh, the, the we're very far from that. Uh, we're even far from it replacing software engineers for it to be able to replace musicians or artists or, or anyone not doing something robotic. But I think robotic work needs to end. It's, ro it's robotic for a reason. It needs a robot to do it. Nobody should be spending their day just tapping on buttons all day long. They should be doing something more useful. Um, I think that's on the redundancy part. Uh, on the music part of mixing Mozart with Fairuz and all that, I think we're going to reach that maybe this year, maybe next year, maybe in a few years. And I think this takes us back to the, to the um, image processing AI, which is, let's say you came up with that idea of mixing those three together. Uh, the boring part is actually doing it. The fun part is coming up with it. And the cool part is when it succeeds. So AI is just taking away that boring part of you having to go get that piece and adjust it and fix it and do it. It'll just do it for you in two seconds and you'll figure out that it's not good enough or it's good enough or it has potential and you're gonna keep modifying it until it fits your original idea. And it will forever be your original idea that did this. And no AI and no machine will be able to replace you thinking of this mix and thinking that this is the mix that will make it. Because what AI would might, might do is just generate billions of possible mixes of, uh, of genres and vocals and stuff. Who picks which one, which one is good? Uh, humans need to actually say this is a, a good piece of art that would actually live. Thank you very much for our panelists and for our guests. Unfortunately, I'm told that we are running out of time, but our panelists will be outside also available for any direct Q&A. I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of ADMATH to thank Mohammed bin Zayed University for Artificial Intelligence for hosting this first of many talks. Our panelists have given us food for thought and content to develop future talk series on music and AI. We thank you very much. Mrs. Huda Kanu, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Eric, Ms. Mohammed, Paula, everyone, thank you very much for your time, and we look forward to welcoming you outside. Thank you. Thank you.